Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News Agency, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we have a man here who's been logging up a lot of miles on airplanes to try to save the planet. That's a pretty good cause, I should say. Uh, he is uh, Sir David King. He's the UK Foreign Secretary's Special Representative for Climate Change. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, the uh, Japanese government is probably about to sign the Paris uh, Agreement very shortly. So it's a very timely press conference uh, to hear about this issue, which uh, if you uh, believe scientists, and, and hopefully most of us do, is something that uh, will have a great impact on our future, especially if we don't get busy and, and start solving some of these issues. So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Sir David King now. Uh, if you have uh, mobile phones, uh, please put it on some kind of a manner mode so we don't get strange noises. And uh, after his presentation, which should last about 25 and a half minutes, then we'll open it up uh, to your Q&A. So please uh, think about some clever questions. All right, uh, Mr. King. Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here. I should say back here. I have spoken to this body before. Um, I'm going to start by just giving you a chart published by NASA in May this year um, showing the temperature change average for the planet since 1880 to May 2016. Um, and I think a, a, a mere glance at this graph will show you that the temperature is rising uh, and has been rising steadily since about 1920 uh, and certainly since 1960 it's been rising on a fairly linear basis. Um, the last 14 months globally have each successive month been the hottest month of that time of the year for the whole planet um, and the hottest years you can see uh, of, of, uh, of actually on record have all been in the last 20 years uh, and of course what this portrays is that the trend is upwards and will go inexorably on upwards unless uh, global actions are taken and that's of course the subject of my discourse here what actions are being taken, what needs to be taken in order to manage this problem so that it doesn't reach what can only be described as unmanageable proportions. Uh, we are sitting on a looming catastrophe and so one question that I have is really do we have time to manage this uh, problem going forward? This is a relatively simple graph showing on the vertical scale the billions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions due to human actions as a function of time from 1990 through to 2035. And the red curve shows the International Energy Agency's measurements on the left-hand side and then forecast uh, on the right-hand side. And the forecast demonstrates that the increase in emissions per annum is less than it has been in the past. And let me tell you now right away why that is. It's because we have globally already been beginning to shift away from fossil fuels towards alternative fuels to provide uh, energy. So 2013, was one such turning point because in the year 2013, for the first time, more than half of the primary energy installation for electricity production for the whole world was of renewable energy. So we are shifting the ground quite rapidly, uh, but nevertheless, that forecast has to be contrasted with the green path which is the required path if we are going to manage that commitment made in Paris to stay at a temperature rise of 2 degrees centigrade or less with a 50% chance. So you'll see that the gap between 
where we are and where we should be is already quite big and as we move forward in time that gap grows very dramatically. So the question then is how will we manage this uh, process? The Paris Agreement had two parts to it. The first part that we will limit our temperature rise to no more than 2 degrees and if possible 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level for the global average. We also received in Paris the nationally determined contributions volunteered by each country of the world, 190 countries, and we can then look at the addition of all of those contributions out to 2030 to see what that contributes to climate change going forward. And the answer is that it is a long way from the two degrees. Um, can I move to the screen? Um, Will people still hear me? Why don't you use uh, this microphone? If I use this mic, right, okay. Um, this is a complicated curve, so I, I just want to take you through it. We see the contributions, say, from China at the present time, and then their planned uh, 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 em greenhouse gas emissions going forward to the year 2030 is this line. So China is planning still to increase its emissions going forward in time, although they are rapidly switching over to renewables and nuclear energy. This is India's contribution, and again, India is expecting its contributions to go on rising. The United States, a diminishing contribution going forward. The European Union, a diminishing contribution, and so on. Russian Federation, almost constant. And when we add up all of these national contributions, you get to this total up here, which shows a, a, a small decrease, a decline in emissions. Now, of course, that is better than the increase that we could have expected under a business-as-usual scenario. What has been separated out from all of these country contributions is land use change. And this has been done because I think this is a critically important area for us to understand. Land use change in terms of equivalent emissions is almost equal to the emissions from China today. By land use change, I'm talking about continued deforestation. The forests are a, a pump for carbon dioxide. They remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So, of course, as we remove forests, we see an equivalent rise in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The largest change going forward in time is therefore due to avoided deforestation. The biggest contribution is from Brazil, where already they have reduced deforestation by 80% compared with 2005. But all forested nations are now working on avoided deforestation. And I want to say right now, we need to turn that around into a reforestation program. And the British government working with China sorry, the British government working with Norway and Germany has created a joint fund of about six billion dollars to work with the forested nations to help them avoiding deforestation but also help them reforestation. And the program 37 forested nations have signed up to with these three countries is to achieve a reforestation equal to an area the size of India by 2030. So we will have reforested an area the size of India if we can manage this program going forward. We think it's a doable problem. If we create new forests the size of India by 2030, that would be equivalent to all of the emissions from the United States today. So in other words, that reforestation program would bring this curve right down to something here. 
And that, I believe, is a critically important pathway to achieving our objective of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Now, here's the, the difficult bit. If we take all of those, including land use change, as they are happening at the moment, and the contributions made by all countries, and then assume an, a, a reasonable acceleration of the rate of decrease of emissions down to close to zero by 2100, what pathway does that give us in terms of temperature rise? And the answer is a three to four degree centigrade pathway. So those, those contributions, when we add them up from countries, does not amount to two degrees. It amounts to almost twice that sort of level. So what that means is the agreement in Paris also included reviewability. What we said was when we've seen all the voluntary contributions from countries, we can add them up and then we have to meet again and decide on how much more we need to do to achieve our objective. Now, I'm going to say that I think not only that is it's doable, but we have to do it because the alternatives are so dire for mankind. Here's the biggest challenge. If you want to ask the question, what pathway should we be on to have a 50% chance of staying at 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level, we need to be on this curve here, hitting close to zero in 2035. Now, what, what that says is that in a very short period of time, the entire global economy has to be defossilized. We have to stop using fossil fuels and we have to have this reforestation program. These curves, the blue and the red, are the prognoses for achieving that same objective but for two degrees, not 1.5. And there are two different curves representing two different estimates. And what you can see is that these also are going to be very challenging if we say we have to hit net zero emissions globally by 2050 to achieve that target. So there's the challenge of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement has set a target for the whole world and on the other hand the voluntary contributions are clearly not enough. That's the, the first message that I want to get across. Um, I am going to get a bit more optimistic as, uh, as my talk proceeds. So before I get into the optimistic uh, period, let me just say quickly uh, what the risks are associated with climate change. If we, well, the British government, together with the governments of India, China and the United States, set out, the British government led this project, on a one-year project to examine the risks of climate change for those four countries of the world. Um, and what we did was take a very different approach to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We brought the insurance and reinsurance sector into this analysis. So this is uh, uh, asking the insurance industry the question, effectively, what would you charge to insure against a series of risks arising from climate change? Which means not what is the most likely outcome for a given level of greenhouse gases, but what is the serious challenges that will even have a, a one or two percent chance of happening? Right? Because every country that is faced with a risk to its future that might only have a 1% chance of happening needs to worry about that because the challenge is one one shouldn't really have to face up to. So let's just um, have a quick look through this uh, analysis and I won't spend much time on it. When I was chief scientific advisor I was Chief Scientific Advisor to the British Government from 2000 to 2007. We had in Central Europe the single worst catastrophe measured in terms of number of fatalities uh, through natural circumstances that we've ever experienced in Central Europe. Now, what I'm showing here is Central European 
average summer temperature in black going back to the year 1900. And you'll see that in 2003, the Central European summer temperature was far hotter than ever experienced before. And in that severe hot summer, the estimated number of lives lost was about 60 to 70,000. Right, so it was a massive disaster. This temperature excursion from the normal was the, of course, the cause of this number of fatalities. People were simply not prepared for that sort of temperature. Now, what I asked the climate science group existing in our meteorological office, the same models that predict the weather for the planet for tomorrow can be used to run forward in time for as many years as you like, but also run backwards. I asked them to run their model backwards for Central Europe, to see how good a description they could get of the black curve. And the red curves are the theoretical attempts to describe the temperature going backwards. So I think you can see it gives one confidence in the modeling. And then when they run forward in time, they had to use a scenario for emissions, and that scenario is called the medium to high emission scenario. We are now on the medium to high emission scenario. And you can see that by the middle of the century, the average temperature in Central Europe will be the same as that hottest summer ever experienced in Central Europe. Now then, when we have an extreme hot summer, an extreme event, then of course that is sitting on this higher baseline. And then the temperature rise will be far greater than that temperature rise in 2003. And that's the nature of the challenge I'm talking about. The risk analysis is not saying, what is the average temperature rise here? It's saying, and then what happens when we have an extreme weather event? So we did a series of analyses based on challenges that each of the governments uh, uh, proposed. Now, th the team was about 120 people. It was composed of... Uh, uh, political advisors, uh, admirals, generals, security advisors from those countries, but also scientists, engineers, and statisticians, uh, and people from the reinsurance industry. And so what, what we did was, first of all, look at probabilities of exceeding temperature rises of 2 degrees centigrade and 4 degrees. Now, th there's a lot of graphs here, but I am going to take it, you through it very carefully. So this is the probability from 0 to 100% that the temperature rise global average will exceed 2 degrees centigrade. And this is the business as usual scenario. The scenario that we are on after Paris is this pale blue one here. And what this says is that by 2030, the chances of the temperature rise exceeding 2 degrees centigrade in any one year are already above the 1% level. And as we move forward in time under this scenario, that probability becomes very likely. That's simply saying that the most probable temperature rise there is rising well above 2 degrees centigrade. That's the 3 to 4 degrees centigrade I told you about before. The dark blue curve is the best possible curve we can hope for in reducing our emissions going forward in time. And even that curve is saying we're approaching a 40% chance of the temperature rise exceeding 2 degrees centigrade. If we look at 4 degrees centigrade, so a temperature rise of 4 degrees centigrade, I'm going to say to you, is uh, severely damaging to the future of mankind. So this is not what we want to see. The dark blue curve is clearly the curve we'd like to be on. Out to 2150, that probability still stays within the 1% to 2% level. But all these other curves, you'll see that as we get past mid-century, the probability of exceeding 4 degrees centigrade global average is already beginning to, uh, to get quite high. Now, 4 degrees centigrade, why do I say that is 
potentially calamitous. If, if we have a temperature exceeding 41, 42 degrees in high humidity for three days, people who are in the shade for three days will die. They cannot get rid of their body heat fast enough. People will survive in air conditioning, but of course, the risk is that air conditioning will fail under those conditions as well. So in uh, various parts of the world where there is not much air conditioning available, fatality rates would be extremely high once temperature rises get to that level. Now the challenge of climate change is not just weather rise, but of course it's also sea level rise and the changes in rainfall patterns, the changes in monsoon patterns and so on. And so flooding is another great challenge. And as a matter of fact, of course, Britain, like Japan, is an island nation. We are surrounded by water. And as the sea level rises, storms at sea means the water incursion in land is further, and more and more people are at risk from flooding. So when, for example, we looked at China, then we found that under a, a, a medium future scenario of emissions, even then, we were looking at up to half a billion people in Southeast Ch China being at risk from flooding uh, in a given year. And that, that's the, the difficulty that we're faced with. This is actually a picture from Pakistan uh, fairly recently. 20 million people affected by the floods in that part of the world. The sea level rise picture is just worth dwelling on because it's the, the biggest challenge. The ocean has an enormous heat content and it means that the heating of the ocean takes place very much more slowly than the heating of the atmosphere. So even as we bring the atmospheric temperature under control, the oceans will go on warming up and, and rising. And of course, the ice on land melting and it entering the ocean will also push the ocean levels up. So under the best possible scenario going forward in time, this is sea level rise going to the end of the century. And you can see that even under this scenario, where the, the atmospheric temperature has plateaued out, the sea level rise is still continuing to go up. And so a sea level rise of the order of one meter by the middle of next century is very much on the cards. And you'll see that this is half a meter by the end of this century, very much on the cards. If we don't manage to get onto this favorable dark blue curve, we have very severe challenges to many of the cities of the world on coastlines, by which I mean the city most at risk is Calcutta, but also Calcutta, Shanghai, New York, London. Many of our cities come under risk when the temperature rises of that order. The big danger from sea level rise is shown on this little graph here, and I'm just going to dwell on it for a moment. As we move up in temperature, when the temperature rise is about 1.3 degrees centigrade above the present level, it's predicted that sea level rise will go through a stepwise increase and reach about seven to eight meters high. Now, obviously, every city on coastlines around the world would not be able to be defended with a sea level rise of that order. Now, what is happening here is mainly the irreversible melting of Greenland ice. If you just melt all the Greenland ice, the sea level rise around the whole world is six and a half meters. Right, so avoiding the melting of the Arctic ice region is critical. And as some of you may know, the Arctic scientists are reporting the loss of sea ice every year. Um, and the loss of sea ice itself doesn't give rise to sea level rise, but it does mean that the Greenland ice sheet is going to melt more quickly because otherwise it was surrounded by sea ice, which reflects sunlight back into space. The water absorbs sunlight and the temperature rises quickly. So there's 
probably enough of a picture of the risk to see that we have to act. There is no choice for us, but we have to act. Um, the UK has been in the lead on actions since uh, um, about 1997. And one reason we've been in the lead was because we did a flood and coastal defense analysis, uh, a large analysis published in 2003 to Parliament. And when I reported that analysis to Parliament, it was a massive wake-up call because the analysis ran forward to 2080 and showed the difficulties for our island nation arising from sea level rise going forward in time. And this is why Britain, our emissions are only 2% of the global emissions, but we immediately began a massive international effort to see that we could manage to persuade every country to reduce its emissions. And that, that effort includes our Climate Change Act of Parliament in 2008, we will reduce our emissions by 80% by 2050, we said. It includes setting up our own international climate fund. That climate fund, at a total of 10 billion pounds, 13 and a half billion dollars, is higher than the total fund sitting in Seoul contributed to by every country of the world. We put 1.2 billion dollars into the Korean Green Climate Fund, and it's sitting at $10.3 billion. So our international climate fund is bigger than the total of the international fund set up through the United Nations process. And we spend that money with developing countries to assist them in two things. One, manage the transition to a low carbon future, leapfrogging our sort of development, and secondly, developing resilience against the challenges of climate change. Now those are the things I really want to pull out. We have uh, a large number of climate attaches around the world, uh, over a hundred. No other country has any climate attaches. So we, we have been putting a very hefty effort into the international uh, a agreement that was reached in Paris. And now we're working to see that we tighten up on that uh, agreement. Just very quickly, let me say, we've had a change in government. We've had a, a, a Brexit vote referendum. And so I just want to assure you, first of all, that the new government has incorporated our Department of Energy and Climate Change into the Department of Business, Energy, Innovation and Skills. And what that means is, whereas before we had a Minister for Climate Change and a Minister for Energy under Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, we now have a Secretary of State for the business community as well. And it means that the Minister for Climate Change is now Minister for Climate Change and Industrial Innovation. So we're taking our business community along this agenda of low carbon development. The 2016, the government, the present government, committed us to the fifth carbon budget. We have five yearly carbon budgets into the future. We have already reduced our emissions by 30% compared with 1990. And the fifth carbon budget for 2032 binds our future governments to a pathway which means we will have reduced our emissions by 57% by 2032. Brexit will not change these commitments. It means that our ratification of the Paris Agreement is guaranteed because the EU is a 40% a reduction by 2030. We will be at 52% by 2030. So we are, uh, easily will ratify that. Brexit may impact on European Union policy, but uh, we don't think it will. There's enough commitment in the European Union to carry that through. My final point is simply, this is the biggest opportunity of our age, in the sense that the transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to a fossil fuel-free economy is the biggest opportunity for science, innovation, technology, wealth creation that we've had probably since the Industrial Revolution. The, the energy 
economy is the biggest single marketplace in the world. It's about expected that we will be spending on these renewable energy technologies three to six trillion dollars of infrastructure investment by 2020. And it's into that marketplace that I'm addressing this comment that this is the biggest opportunity of our age. This is an op-ed that I wrote for Science Magazine in January this year. The falling costs of, of energy installation are dramatic, but we also need other technologies. And these other technologies include energy storage, include smart grids. They have not been developed under the feed-in tariff regime introduced in Europe. And so what I pushed for was something we called the Global Apollo Program that was taken up here in Japan, and it became called Mission Innovation on the first day of Paris. And we had 22 nations agreeing to join this program. Every nation agreeing has promised to double their publicly funded research and development into clean energy development by 2020. And this means we will be spending $30 billion a year on this program in these 22 countries by that time. And of course, Japan is there, the United States is there, Britain is there, France is there, etc. The major countries are there, including China and India. What are we going to be doing? Well, the first thing is that Bill Gates and his group of investors, 29 investors, pledged about $20 billion. That's total, not per annum. $20 billion in wealth, wealthy individuals' money being put forward to fund the new technologies that emerge from this program and take them into the marketplace. This is venture capital money sitting waiting for the new technologies to emerge from this big thrust in uh, investment. Now what, what is this going to look like? I just give you a clue here. We had a meeting last week in London, the first meeting to determine the science challenges for mission innovation. Let me emphasize, the mission is to allow every country to have 100% clean energy, zero carbon dioxide emission energy on the grid or off-grid meaning we can use renewable energy sources for off-grid villages and islands around the world for all purposes by 2025 to 2030. We should have all of the technologies available into the marketplace as a result of this piece of work. We're going to focus on on-grid and off-grid renewable and grids, renewable fuels, the sustainability you'll see is low carbon dioxide emission materials, replacing steel and concrete, for example, and the urban environment, heating and cooling efficiencies, uh, etc. All of these technologies will emerge from this collaborative program uh, that was developed in Paris. There's the opportunity that underlies all of this, and the second co-benefit I want to mention is the health benefit to everybody on the planet. Fossil fuels have never been a clean source of energy and the sources of energy we're now looking at are basically solar, geothermal um, uh, and, and wind and so on which do not produce C2.5 particulate matter, do not produce NOx gases. We're all going to be a lot healthier as a result of this program. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was a little bit more than 25 and a half uh, <laughs> minutes, Sorry. but it was very stimulating, so I kind of lost track of the time. Uh, we do have about 20 minutes or so for uh, Q&A. I see that we've set up the microphone on this side. Uh, when I call on you, please give your name and affiliation before you ask your question. And since we do only have 20 minutes, please limit to one question. And uh, if there's not enough questions, I'll come back around to you. And I'd like to start out with working press. So work, any working press uh, journalists who'd like to ask a question, uh, you can go first. Uh, Errol. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sir David King. My name is Erol Ahmed. I have a small research outfit. I also freelance. Um, when I was watching the presidential debate about uh, 10 days ago between uh, Mr. Hillary Clinton and Mr. Trump, um, there was a remark uh, from uh, Hillary Clinton about Mr. Trump's um, vision of renewable energy. And I believe she said, Mr. Trump believes this is a Chinese scam. I think these were, these were, these were the words she used. In case he's elected, uh, do you expect any, um, any changes in the US policy? Or if this political thing is going to have some kind of an impact on the global consensus uh, you were mentioning? Thank you very much. Sorry, the question is? The question the is, of if, he is, if he wins the election or if the American and U.S. election is going to have any impact um, in right. terms of policy change. Thank you. I mean, the, the American presidency has always played a critical role in, uh, in the agreements that have been attempted to be reached. Remember, the Paris Agreement took 21 years. And I'm going to say it's President Obama in the presidency in the United States that has allowed that agreement to go through in Paris. Um, it, is, it is therefore critical to see that the incoming president uh, understands the challenges of climate change. Let me just leave it at that. I think the, the, the rest of the world is now on a pathway through these commitments that are now going to come forward at Marrakesh, at COP22 in November this year, the rest of the world is committed down the route of the Paris Agreement. And uh, the United States, by the way, having ratified through President Obama, means that the US has already ratified that agreement. The incoming president cannot undo that ratification. Um, uh, at least I understand that if the incoming president wanted to undo that ratification, it would involve a long legal process. So I think we, the rest of the world, will understand we have ratified that agreement and we will go ahead and act on that basis. Okay, uh, yes, Robin. Robin Harding from the Financial Times. Thank you, Sir David, for the stimulating talk. Um, you say we're now on a pathway through the Paris Agreement um, and nations meeting these commitments, but they are voluntary commitments, are they not? And historically, none of these commitments have ever been met. Um, I.e. Kyoto was, uh, in theory, meant to achieve this but did not. So uh, my question is, why should we believe that nations will now fulfill these commitments, particularly given that they need to make further commitments in order to actually achieve the goals they have set out? Thank you. I think there's, there's two ways to answer this, and one of them is actually very simple. Prior to the agreement in Paris, and in a way I'm disagreeing with what you've just said, we already reached the point I described where primary energy installation was more than 50% of total global energy installation. So the, the, the move is happening, why? Basically because of feed-in tariffs in Europe creating a volume of demand for the production of particularly photovoltaics and wind turbines, and the cost of those has continually come down. So what has happened is that in many parts of the world, solar is already competitive with new coal installation. Now there's the winning streak that will, that will come through into the system. In other words, pure economics is determining that many countries will switch away from fossil fuels into clean energy futures, simply because it's in their economic interest. Now I do think that the nations that have made these commitments are serious about them. I think you're wrong to refer to Kyoto. Kyoto was a process that was never finally agreed to in full form. 
whereas Paris, we've got 190 plus nations agreeing to that process. I don't know how many have ratified today, but it's probably over 70, and we've certainly exceeded the 55% required for full ratification. So I, th I think we're in a very different and a far healthier place now for two reasons. One, the technology coming through to the marketplace, and second, a much better understanding of the risks of climate change. Uh, so the, the program that I was talking about in China and India, for example, after we'd finished that program, both the Chinese and the Indian governments have continued with their own programs looking at the risks of climate change impacts to their parts of the world. So there's a much greater degree of awareness of what is happening. Okay, any other working press before we move on? Are you working? Okay, those are. Working press, people who write copy. My name is Steven Stepchansky, I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News. Um, with the Fukushima disaster here in Japan, uh, there's been expansion of coal, gas, and oil-fired uh, power plants. Um, there decarbonization goals have been set back a bit because of this. Uh, do you think that this is a problem for Japan? Uh, and do you have any uh, criticisms of their current policies? Or, or, or maybe do you have any just comments regarding what they're, what they're doing right now at the moment? Thank you. Um, clearly, uh, with, uh, with something like 52 nuclear power stations in Japan, being switched off as a result of Fukushima and only three of them up and running today, there has been a, a massive shift in the position of the Japanese government to provide secure energy for the people of Japan. Um, if, if you ask me, is Japan now uh, going to stick to its new nationally determined contribution, a 26% reduction in emissions by 2030. After the discussions I've had over the last day and a half, I would have to say, yes, I believe they are committed to that, and that they will deliver on their nationally determined contribution. Um, there is a, a real appetite to see that they do that uh, delivery, and there are, are many think tanks and people in government working on making sure that that happens. Um, where does this put the Japanese economy going forward in time? I think my worry is around the issue of stranded assets. I would advise against any country building new coal-fired power stations today, principally because I do not believe you can expect those power stations to be operating in even 15 years' time. When you invest in energy infrastructure, you expect to get a return on your investment for the following 40, 50 years. But if you invest in coal-fired power stations, I do not believe that anywhere in the world we're going to be able to continue producing electricity from them unless, and this is a very important unless, unless you capture the carbon dioxide emitting and emitted and store it or use it with irreversibly so it doesn't emit again. The carbon capture and storage process needs to be designed into the structure of the coal-fired power station. Otherwise the cost becomes, I would say, prohibitively high. And in the United States, companies that have had coal-fired power stations have under the new legislative requirement, which means that you cannot emit more than X kilograms, where X is a number I've forgotten, of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. Rather than capture the carbon dioxide to meet that condition, they've simply switched the coal-fired power stations off and built new uh, gas-fired power stations, or renewable. So I, I think my, my worry for the Japanese government is what it will do to the economy by putting a hefty investment into an area which may not give a full economic return on the investment. Okay, now we're opening it up to uh, the whole room. Uh, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, sir. 
Uh, my name is Hiro Kujita, full-time freelance uh, journalist with the uh, Yukon Fuji evening uh, paper daily. Um, I'd like to separate the end and means. And I totally support your mission and also the business opportunity for the new uh, invest, uh, investment. But uh, I still believe myself that uh, nuclear power generation is existing ways to attain the common goal. So how would you weigh the existing means for achieving a purpose? Thank you. Could I just ask, is this a question relating to Japan or globally? No, no, global. Right. Yes. Uh, my friend, uh, Professor Emeritus of Oxford University, Wade Allison, is a strong believer of the nuclear power generation as a means. I, I believe that nuclear power has a critical role to play in many parts of the world, uh, but not in all parts of the world. So in, uh, in most countries that lie between the tropics, there's actually plenty of sunshine to provide all of the electricity you need, provided you've got energy storage capacity. In uh, uh, countries in Northern Europe, and I count Britain as one of these, we still are in Europe. Um, th in countries in Northern Europe, there is not enough sunlight to guarantee electricity around the, the year. In Britain, we have a lot of wind, and we are going to farm offshore wind, and I think we can provide a high percentage of our requirement from wind. But I do not believe we can manage at this time without nuclear new build, and our government is now on a policy of nuclear new build. Um, I think that, in other words, this is a country-dependent question. Uh, Japan is a seismically active part of the world, and that clearly is an issue. But I know the British experts who have looked at the nuclear power stations in Japan, and I do understand that a good 25 of those power stations are in positions where they could be brought back into use, and in my view, that would be a good way forward. Okay, I'm Mr. Ambassador. My name is Khalil Hassan. I'm Ambassador of Bahrain. I very much enjoyed your work in this area. You talked about deforestation. Forestation. What's the practical, how it's going to be done? What's the detail of something like this? Thank Sorry. you, sir. What? Forest, forest, reforestation yes. you discussed. How it's going to be done? Right. Thank you, sir. Um, so we, we are now rapidly gaining experience on both avoided deforestation and on reforestation or afforestation. Um, the, the mode of operation is a lengthy one because the, the tropical rainforests, for example, have to go through several phases of development. The land left after the tropical rainforests have been removed, as I'm sure you're aware, that is not very fertile land. And so there's a, a development where you have to plant trees with fertile uh, soil available and then succeed these with larger trees. You have to go through quite a process before you begin to create the tropical cover that the forest needs to operate properly in. Um, in uh, Kenya, for example, in Africa, there's a, a large experimental area under development. In South America, there's a much more advanced series of uh, uh, developments, for example, in Brazil, in the Northeast Atlantic region. Uh, in Costa Rica, the, the country has now already reforested most of the areas that were formerly forested, were deforested, and they have now reforested. So there are some good stories. And what the British, German, and Norwegian governments are doing is to spread best practice through our uh, uh, program. So we're, we're very keen to see that 
where we learn how to manage this process, we can transfer that knowledge to other countries. I'm not saying it's easy, but we are saying it's necessary and it's something we can do. How much, do, how long will it take to be effective? Oh, I, th I think we're talking about a process that in total is going to be, by the time it's running itself, is going to be 15 to 20 years. And after that, the total cost per capture of, of, of a ton of carbon dioxide, we're estimating at about seven to eight dollars. It's the cheapest way to capture carbon dioxide is this reforestation program. And uh, I mean, that's another factor. In all of this, we have to focus on what is affordable. Okay, and I'll take the last question myself, uh, which is, it seems to be the biggest roadblock to seriously tackling climate change is coming from politics and from, shall we say, education as well. Um, now, we're a media organization here. How do you evaluate the way that the media is handling the climate change issue, and what do you want to see the media doing that will make the general public uh, better aware of what you see as the real risks going forward? I think, I think, of course, as you know, there's no single media. Um, I, I, let me just refer to a, a Pew poll, P-E-W, uh, of, uh, of the uh, press coverage of climate change in the sense that it's a challenge rather than in, in the sense that it's not a challenge. Um, they concluded that the only place where media predominantly didn't cover the science uh, findings was in the English-speaking areas. And uh, it was inevitable that they concluded that this was due to the climate skeptics funding in the United States, uh, but also the support of various news agencies in the United States uh, against the climate change science. Um, but in other parts of the world, for example, I have now traveled to 87 countries in the last three years. I would say I find none of that discussion in the developing world. I find very little of it in most of the non-English speaking parts of the world. So it is uh, an English language speaking problem. But there is another factor. Uh, the media, I think, for very obvious reasons, can tire of an issue. Uh, you're obviously writing copy to sell copy, and you must feel that uh, eventually your audience no longer wants to hear these stories about climate change. Now, in a sense, that's not a real risk, because those of us working for governments in the area can work under the radar. But it is a risk, because we need public acceptance of the government decisions that are being taken. So you're asking a very good question, but only the media can answer it, really. Okay, well, thank you very much for a very stimulating hour here. Now, I know that you've traveled to 87 countries, but uh, we do think that uh, you may be coming back by Japan sometime in the future. And if you do, we have a wonderful main bar out there and, and many friendly people. So we're going to offer you here a one-year honorary membership to the FCCJ. So thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we do have a little bit of good news for those journalists who wish to follow up with him. Uh, he'll stay a couple of minutes to exchange uh, business cards with you so that you can uh, and get your questions answered in the future. Thank you very much for coming today.